We're in Tanagona with Professor Di Feng, Di Feng, Li. Di Feng Li. Yes. From, from where? From the School of Oriental and African Studies. Mm -hmm. in London. Okay. Yes. And what's your professional occupation then? I'm, I'm a reader in translating studies. Mm -hmm. I'm also the director for the Center of Translating Studies at the school. And uh, we write doctor program in translation studies as well as an MA in the theory and practice of translation. Okay. Yeah, so I'm both the director and also the tutor for the PhD students plus the convener of the MA in translation program. Okay. You're not originally from London? No, I'm I not. Suspect. Before that, I was actually in, in Hong Kong. I taught at the Chinese University of Hong Kong for 10 years. Okay. Yeah. Um, we had a department of translation, and it's actually one of the um, the oldest one in that region. So, yeah. okay. Are you originally from Hong Kong? No, I actually originally I'm originally from the Chinese mainland, Nanjing. Nanjing, okay. it's like a, a city close, it's somewhere in the middle of, the, of of China, but close to the eastern coast, sort of middle east of so China. You went from the uh, People's Republic to Hong Kong yeah. to study, or, or and no, no. I actually um, did my BA and MA in Nanjing Normal University. Mm -hmm. That's also where I grew up, and I then worked in my alma mater, Nanjing Normal University, for three or four years, teaching English and translation. Mm -hmm. But then I thought I had a need to really um, um, pursue uh, first, further advanced studies, so I went to Canada. Okay. And so, how old were you then when you went there? I was, at that time, 26. I think I finished, I finished my MA at uh, 26. And then, yeah, I think just before I turned 30, I went okay. to the university. That's quite late. Uh, so were yes. you working as well as studying in this period? Um, no, I, I think I did my BA from 83 to 87, and then from 87 to 90. Okay. And yeah. then I s s worked there for about three years. In 1994, I went to the University of Alberta, where I actually studied in the Faculty of Education and my specialization was second language education. So you left translation or you weren't into translation at that stage? Well, I, I did do my MA in translation. Okay. Yeah, and then I did uh, my doctorate in second language education. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that in the second year of my PhD program, I had my son. And oh. then I had family to, to, okay. to, to, to raise, yes. to feed. So I started to look for jobs and just somehow I got this offer from the Chinese River Stone Hong Kong. Okay. And they, yeah, I thought it was very because I had a background in, in, in translation and also this background in education. Actually, it, it, it worked quite well. I, um, I have never really regretted studying in the faculty of mm -hmm. education. I thought, uh, I think actually it's one of the best things that happened to me. What, why is that? Because I think, especially like you think of that time, it's between like 1994 to 1997. I think uh, as far as, in terms of the discipline, I, I personally don't believe that like, translation studies is that well developed at that time. Mm -hmm. If we just looked at the literature by that time, we don't really have that much around. While education is a really very well developed uh, discipline. In terms of research methodology? In terms of research methodology, in terms of its interdisciplinarity. Like, for example, I took a course of, of uh, curriculum and curricular inquiry there. You read about education, of course, but you also read about philosophy, mm -hmm. phenomenology, hermeneutics psychoanalysis, basically anything sociology, anthropology. So like you, by taking that course, you know, you are uh, uh, getting into many other raised areas as well. And of course the other thing is what you just mentioned, research methodology. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best thing 
you know, I get trained at the university. So, so we know you as the author of uh, research reports, really, on training and where graduates go and what people think. You're using methodologies that have come from your doctorate then. That's right. That's right. That's actually I, I, how I started my career as, again, like as a teacher of translation, mm -hmm. translation steps. I thought that was a good sort of a, a, a point for me to sort of put the two catch up areas together. So, because I've got the methodology and I'm interested in teaching. So, as a, as a young teacher, so at that time, I think it's probably the best way to, for me to get started. Had you worked as a translator? Yes. And um, as a freelance translator, mm -hmm. not never a full-time translator. Mm -hmm. Because I remember back in Nanjing doing my MA in translation, I started doing freelance translation and then also in Canada. So, well, while I'm doing my doctorate, I also work as a, a freelance translator. But okay. also, like, throughout all these many years of teaching translation, because personally, I believe as a teacher of translation, you know, you need to, you have to have the skill. And also, it's also a good way for you to really uh, sort of keep abreast with the development in the market. And I think uh, that's very important, as we just did this oral uh, for the PhD student this morning. I mean, it's, it's very like when, when there's a good interaction between the training programs and the market, I think we, we are likely to get the best result. Can you tell us something about the, the uh, research that you did and, and the things you discovered in about training? It's, it's basically in Hong Kong. Right. right. Yeah. Um, the first sort of uh, report I did was uh, um, in the context of uh, translated teaching in Hong Kong. I think that they were, I mean, the first sort of discovery I, I, I made there was there was only like 20% of our translation graduates actually become translators. And I think that, because that has a very big implication for the training programs. How do you, you know, design this curriculum? How do you try to meet the needs of the students? I think the percentage is pretty similar in Spain. Right. 20, 30 percent. Yeah. And then the other thing is about, for example, like the, in terms of the great debate in translation is whether translation theory is useful to the students. I think it's so interesting. Like I, I surveyed the, the current students at the university at that time. I think the majority of the students didn't believe theory was mm -hmm. useful. They didn't like the course that much. But surprisingly, when I interviewed the professional translators, most of them believed theory was important. And they found they, they, they were very happy that they did learn theory at the university. I said, why is that? Why do you think like theory is so good? Because generally, we believe, you know, like professional translators would think proper practice is more important as here, although they like theory, but they say, so what? Because here, we quite often work as in-house translators. We have to deal with our supervisors. Mm -hmm. And our supervisors, they, they actually don't know anything about translation, but they like to tell you how to do translation. And then, so for me as a, as a, a subordinate, they use the word, and then the best way to tell them is to say, I have this theory which can explain my practice. And I think with theory as my backing, I can really, really um, do what I believe is right. So I think that's very interesting. What kind of research do you think we need these days? Well, personally, I think um, as I, I think I have probably two, two areas I believe that's very important for translation studies. One is the research methodology in translation studies. Because I think I have probably have two reasons. One is I think now we generally believe that translation studies as a discipline is quite well established or many would believe it's, it's already a quite independent discipline. And I think that as for a discipline to really grow, uh, we do need the research methodology mm -hmm. to really find a way to make our work more, you know, rigorous. Do you think we have or need methods that are different from any other social science? Um, not, 
really, but I think there is again, like how we uh, make the, these general research methods in, of social science work for translation studies. I think there is a, a, a thing called problem adaptation in how to adapt these methods to work for us best. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's one of the things that we need to do as a discipline needed, and also for a for our um, students. And with the rise of translation studies, we have an increase of PhD students, right? and they all need methodology. And actually, last year I I, I uh, started a course for research methods in translation studies at the SOAC the School of Oriental African Studies. And actually, like I was very happy because by the end of the year, I got in terms of teaching evaluation and also the comments that students um, like for most of these um, parameters they gave five out of five. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed and also the, in terms of written comments quite a few said this is the best course I've had. So it's, it's addressing a, a real need. Yes, so yes, it's a real need. I think they, they said like, especially like I think uh, half of our students actually went on to PhD programs, they believe that's a good way for them to get started because they were able to write. Uh, that's about process. how we do research. Yeah. What should we be doing research on? Do you have, see any areas, any um, research questions that should be dealt with? Or is it um, uh, I would think, uh, because I think now it's really sort of to my background, because I'm from, originally from, from China and also um, I'm now in the School of Oriental African Studies, I believe, as an as a area that needs more attention. Also, an area of growth in translation studies is the probably is, uh, research into the Asian um, translation traditions, or not necessarily Asian, probably non European uh, translation traditions, because we know very little. Uh, in translation, even translated training in many of those countries. I think that's something we can um, probably uh, do more work. And actually now I, I'm, uh, I just started working with uh, Springer, um, developing some of a new series in, uh, uh, in translation studies. I think we want to, for me, I think I have sort of two, two uh, focus there. One is the uh, focus on non-European mm -hmm. uh, uh, translation or translation theory um, really want to highlight, the, for example, the Asian translation traditions. Mm -hmm. And the other one is really the, the um, data-based empirical study in translation. So, like, mm -hmm. based uh, translation studies or like the psycholinguistic or neurolinguistic approach to translation skills. And I personally, because I think I'm very interested in, in those areas. I think those, for me, would be really the exciting area to, to work in this. Okay, thank you. If anything, thank you very much before the restaurant overwhelms us. <laughs> <laughs>